In your bulletins, there's a couple of things that I can bring your, to your attention. Uh, one is a communication card, and I invite you, if you're here today, to just fill that out. Let us give us in for any information if you, that you would like us to remember in prayer or things that you would like us to help you with. Uh, fill out this communication card and then drop it into the, either one of the offering boxes or out in the back at the, at the guest table as you came in. And then <clears throat> there's also an offering envelope. Uh, we don't pass the offering bag around uh, because of uh, health issues. So there's an offering envelope. Again, there's an offering box at each of the doors and also one in the uh, hallway out there and would uh, encourage you to participate in, in uh, helping out the ministries of this church, but more than that, in just giving out a generosity. And um, I can see that we're on the uh, Christmas holiday, isn't that right? <laughs> yeah, loving the Christmas holiday. And a lot of people are taking off. And <clears throat> but uh, I'm very glad that you're here. Now, a reminder, there will be no Sunday school next Sunday. And there's a couple, the thing I want to remind you about, the reason there's no Sunday school next Sunday is we just don't have enough teachers. If you'd like to volunteer and help with that, please speak to Allie or Nick, and uh, they will get you plugged in. Uh, also, we have, we're starting again to have our after-service snacks. Uh, I find that, yes, I find that people fellowship much better if they have something in their hands to eat and so forth. And so, uh, but we need your help. Uh, it's a volunteer thing. And if you can help us and, and would like to participate in, in, in helping the snacks, there's a sign-up sheet outside there at the welcome table, or you can speak to our Lynn. And uh, we're working together, wanting to work together closely with the hub in order to... Um, Help with their ministry up there. So, uh, please see Arlene or sign up at the welcome table there. Uh, other announcements you'll find in your bulletin here. Uh, every week I'm reminded, where would we be if we didn't have a bulletin? <laughs> I'm very grateful for those who put that together. <clears throat> this is what we call the Christmas season. How many of you enjoy the Christmas, ah, one more announcement, thank you very much. Uh, Friday, this Friday, 6.30 p.m., we are having a Christmas Eve candlelight service, uh, and uh, invite you to come, invite you to participate, and it's just, we're going to be, there's going to be a lot of singing, and a lot of time of fellowship, and it's Christmas Eve, I mean, come on, what more needs to be said? It's just part of the what we would call the spirit of Christmas. And that's what I want to speak about today is the spirit of Christmas and what that means. Because we might say that this is a... How many of you just enjoy this season? Yeah, it's okay. You can express yourselves. <laughs> it's, um, it comes around annually and I, I, keep, I, I keep hearing from people I, <clears throat> because I'm not a big fan actually, but... Uh, I hear people talking about Christmas and how it's uh, such a joyful time, it's a family time, and it's warm and fuzzy and, and so forth. And Christmas Day, though, Christmas is a Christian holy day. And as a Christian holy day, it's interesting that nearly the whole world wants to join in celebrating with us on this day, on this Christmas day. Um, I don't know if you noticed or not, but uh, the, it's not the, uh, it's not the Takashimaya, it's the one where Chili's is. What's that one? Ma, ma, Mitsukoshi, the Mitsukoshi apartment store. Outside the, apart, the, 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 the department store there, big banners saying, uh, Christmas miracle. I'm going, whoa. <laughs> Where, where does this department store get this banner, this promotion, Christmas Miracle? Uh, it's just part of the fuzzy feeling we like for Christmas. It's part of the whole the ethos of, uh, of the Christmas. The whole world wants to join in with Christians on this day in celebrating. I, there's a lot of holy days. I, I don't necessarily celebrate all of them, but uh, Lent is one where many Christians then uh, are, are remembering and 
uh, the, the time of 40 days before the resurrection. Palm Sunday, we oftentimes recognize here, celebrating Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. And then there's Good Friday. Don't know what's so good about it, but that's the name that's been given. That's the day that we remember the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And of course, the day that, the, that we as Christians find so important is probably the most important day of our Christian calendar because it celebrates the event of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. His coming back to life. I mean, we would have nothing. We, there'd be no point in being here without that day. However, Christmas is by far the most popular Christian holiday in our world. Culturally, socially, especially economically, and for some, spiritually. It's just, it seems as if the whole world is waiting for this time to come. Now I know uh, it might be particularly true of uh, Westerners, and hopefully particularly true of Christians. I know that in this country and in much of uh, Asia, Chinese New Year is the big deal. It doesn't have the religious connotations that this does, but uh, and oftentimes it's, again, a time of family. But here's the thing. I'm not saying that um, Christians don't try hard to keep Christ in Christmas. We try every year. It's an annual thing to make this valiant attempt to bring, to bring Christ back into Christmas. One of the reasons is because many people, especially non-Christians, non-believers, the secular culture, the world, they desperately want to join in the spirit of this holiday just so long as we leave Christ out of Christmas. And so we can enjoy as much as we like, but don't want to have Christ in Christmas. Leave him out. Many deny the person of Christ. There's choirs that'll sing Christmas carols. There's um, churches that even sing the Messiah. It's interesting because there's certain churches that don't even believe in the Messiah that want to sing the Messiah at Christmas time. There's a deep human longing though at this Christmas time for that sense of joy, the sense of peace. I would say even the silent night. It's a time when we want the clamor of this life to just settle down a bit. It's all a part of this spirit of Christmas. Well, a pastor named Tim Keller put it like this. Every editorial page as Christmas comes up, every advertisement, every Christmas movie will do their very best to extract the spirit of Christmas or the principles of Christmas away from the person of Christmas. They'll do their very best without direct reference to Christ or talking about his person and his claims. They'll try to attract the principles of love and compassion and of unity and of justice. But we're not going to mention Jesus, the Christ. The thing is, Within humanity, there's just these human longings for these things that we would consider the spirit of Christmas. There's stories about how in the battles of war, there's a pause and a quietness because of the Christmas season. These longings for the spirit of Christmas, though, they're doomed to failure because the spirit of Christmas cannot be removed from the person of Christmas. And that's the, that's the point. We cannot have the spirit of Christmas without the person, without Jesus Christ. He's the founder of our faith. It's his birth. It's the only reason for this true spirit of Christmas. Let me say that again. That's the only reason for the true spirit of Christmas. No Jesus, no Christmas. And people would say, and have said, well, that's a very bold claim to exclusiveness, isn't it? And people point their fingers at you Christians and us Christians and say, oh, you're being exclusive. You're saying that you are the only ones. No, I'm just simply saying 
it's not possible to have Christmas without the Christ. The world strives and yearns and pines and desires for peace and joy. Yet, <clears throat> how successful have we been? How well are we doing at finding the peace and joy that everyone so longs for? How well are we doing at slowing down the pace of life to enjoy it? It's, it's something that we humans are failing at, if we'll admit it. Now, <clears throat> I'd like to look at a portion of the Christmas story in Luke chapter 2, before we get into the, the meat of the, uh, of the sermon today. Luke chapter 2, verses 25 to 35. And in this passage of Scripture, Jesus' parents take young Jesus, baby Jesus, to the temple. We're told that um, when <clears throat> they come to the temple, they're coming there because of the Old Testament heritage that they have, the law. And in the law, according to this custom, they're supposed to then present the firstborn. When they take Jesus there, <clears throat> they, a man sees them coming. This is, I, I find this very interesting. The scriptures tell us there's a man named Simeon. He's righteous and devout. Why is he in the temple though? He's waiting for the consolation of Israel. The word consolation means comfort. And I'll be honest, comfort is one of my favorite words. I love the word comfort. I like to wear certain clothes because they're comfortable. I like the certain temperature because it brings comfort. There's comfort foods. This word comfort is definitely a spiritual word <laughs> because here he is righteous and devout, awaiting for the consolation, the comfort of Israel. Why is he waiting there? Because Simeon has been given a promise. We're told that the Holy Spirit has promised him that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ, the Lord's Messiah. What an amazing promise that is. Here he is way up in age, and yet faithfully he goes to the temple in anticipation and with a certainty that he will receive this promise because God gave it to him. And there he meets the Christ. And he says about the Christ, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for mine eyes have seen your salvation. Uh, I, I, very much, I, very much, I very much need a sense of reality. And I so love this story about Simeon who's been, been given this promise that he's going to see the salvation, his salvation, and he holds him in his arms. And he says, now that I've experienced this, you can take me. You can dismiss me. You're, you're a servant. And then Simeon turns to, Joseph, to Jesus' parents, Joseph and Mary. And he particularly addresses his mother. He says to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Excuse me just a minute. <clears throat> This is a bit of a foreboding message. This is why this message is rarely ever preached in pulpits on Christmas and during this Christmas season. But there's an importance here because this sense of foreboding in, in, in Simeon's voice is this. There's a, a promise of division. Jesus is going to divide the nation in two. Some, as we see in the very life of Jesus when we read about him, some embrace Jesus and follow him and become his disciples. Others, absolutely not. Resist, 
reject, refuse. That means that some, as though, I mean, though some will respond and others will oppose, it means that Jesus is to be a, spot, a, a sign that will be spoken against. They will contend against Jesus. So when we come to this part, this is where the key issue comes. This is where the doctrine of incarnation is rejected, refused. Many people will chafe under this because it's a very narrow, exclusive teaching that we have as Christians. That God came into this world as a human and his name is Jesus. And we have to understand, folks, that that is a very core. That is a very center. It is the doctrine of Christmas that we believe in, and yet it is this very doctrine that divides. That's why Christ is not welcome in Christmas, because of the claim that he is, in fact, God. I'd like you just go through two important statements that we see here in this temple encounter. One is this. We cannot take the principles away from the person because the principles are based on the person. <laughs> He's the Prince of Peace. You can't have peace without the Prince of Peace. He is joy. There's not to be joy until we had our sinfulness taken care of. We can't take these principles then of the person and separate them from the person. And the second thing we see here that Simeon tells us is that the thoughts of your heart are revealed. Here's when we come face to face with the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ. We need to look at our heart because this is the doctrine of Christmas. And it will reveal those thoughts and motives of our heart. Things that we may not want to be revealed. And Paul is one who writes very clearly about this. Paul's letter to the Romans is not known to be about the Christmas story. It's not known as a Christmas scripture passage. But it does <laughs> emphasize a very important doctrine, the doctrine of Christmas, about Jesus, son of David, son of God. So, <clears throat> I want to read then from uh, Romans chapter 1, the first four verses. It's the introduction introductory of this letter that Paul writes to the church in Rome. And in there he says, beginning with verse 1, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. There's a couple of important things to notice here. Paul writes strongly, clearly, about the humanity of Jesus. Um, I've said it many times, the whole concept of God is far beyond our human ability to be able to grasp, to be able to embrace the infinite, the boundless. So Paul writes then about Jesus' humanity. He says, according to the flesh. He's a descendant then of the line of David. This is what's wonderful about having an Old Testament. This is what's wonderful about having a people whose history is recorded in this old book, this old history book. And we can start uh, from the beginning. Okay, 
Thank you. I don't want to trip. We can start from the beginning and we can see how the lineage that's recorded in the Old Testament clearly comes down to both Joseph and Mary, particularly Mary as the mother of Jesus, of the line of David. This speaks of his humanity. It's a clear allusion to the messianic stature of the Son, Jesus. And he also uses the word flesh. That's an interesting word. That word flesh speaks to <clears throat> humanity, us, flesh and blood. And more and more, it's just so incredible to, incredible to me that the great God of creation should come down to this flesh. Um, that, um, oh, I, what's that? Um, this happens my old age. I, I, these words just fly out of... Anyway, there's, <laughs> forget it, I'm just going to move on. <clears throat> With this word flesh, it emphasizes the transitory, the weak, the frail nature of that existence. According to the flesh, Paul uses that 21 times. It denotes then being or living according to what? Merely human. Merely human. In this world. He goes on to say, not only is Jesus humanity according to the flesh, but he says now, according to the spirit of holiness, according to the spirit of holiness, this Jesus is declared to be the Son of God. And so we have something in incredible. Within this humanity, we have the fullness of God. It's God and human together, not in separate parts, completely and perfectly united. He's declared to be the Son of God, and it's that resurrection, Jesus coming back from the dead, Jesus conquering death, Jesus overcoming the curse, that sets him apart and authenticates his claim to deity. C.S. Lewis, you may know him or heard of him, a very famous uh, apologetic writer, he, he puts out a book called Mere Christianity, and he writes this. It... it <clears throat> helps us to think properly about this claim here. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with a man who says, hello, my name is Poached Egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. All of us must make our choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or he is a madman or something worse. You can't just say Jesus is a nice guy. He's a wonderful teacher. He's either the Son of God, he's either God the Son, or he's an idiot, a fraud of the worst kind. And even to go as far as to say, in such that such a fraud would be similar to the devil of hell. And Paul makes this bold declaration that this son, this son of God is none other than, and he says it, Jesus Christ our Lord. So, quickly now, why is this incarnation so important? What's the big deal about it? Why is it so essential? Why is it that it cannot divorce, be divorced from this season that we call Christmas? I want to speak with regard to the spirit of Christmas. And in the spirit of Christmas, I'd like us to understand what our place is. What our place is. The spirit of Christmas is knowing my place. And here it is. <clears throat> There's the essence of sin. What is it we're talking about when we speak about the essence of sin? Some would say sin is disobeying mom and dad. And I would totally agree. But that's not what sin really is. Some would say, well, if you speed and, and you go too fast, you break the law. That's a sin. Um, actually, what it is, it's the result of sin. It's sin's result. Because when we look at it, the heart and crux and essence of sin is when humans then take God's place. We become 
God. And here's the thing. We did not create ourselves. We do not keep ourselves alive. We do not have control of life. We cannot make life work like we want it to. And yet, we insist on being our own master, our own king. I was going to say president, but it's much more than being president. <laughs> we insist on being our own Lord and, and God. The essence of sin is when we, as God's creation, usurp the place of God. We make ourselves to be God. It may be difficult to admit it, but when we stop and think about it, what we're saying is, ain't nobody telling me what to do. I'm going to do what I think I should do. I'm in control of my life. I think it's easier to say when you're younger than when you're older. <laughs> when you get older, things happen to your body you just don't have anything to say about. And you realize you're less God than you think. So then, what is then, if that's the essence of sin, what is the essence of salvation? What is God's response? Now, the, the typical response of a king to someone who has usurped the king's position is to strike him down. Get rid of them. They're finished. It's over. But the response of God is this. It's not of opposition. Amazingly so. What does he do? Incredibly. He takes our place. He takes our place. We insist on taking God's place and being God, but God says, no. Let me take your place. Let me step in there. But if we would consider for a moment what it means to, to uh, consider what we think of life, leaving, just for a moment, if we can do it, leave God out of the picture. Leave, just pretend there is no God. And look at our deepest, innermost thoughts. And there would be a conviction. There would be a conviction that we're not living life as we should be. Would you agree with me that most people would agree they're not a perfect person? You don't need God to tell you you're not a perfect person. There's just something about within our nature that tells us and reminds us, maybe repeatedly, we're not what we should be. We're not living life the way we should. Now, this happens quite often. Oh, we, we'll point at somebody else. We'll look at them and see what they're doing. Oh. I don't do that. I don't smoke and I don't dance and I don't go with those who do, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Well, we're, it's a comparison thing. We like to make ourselves feel better than others. But when we look closely, we realize we're merely admitting that we have set standards that we accept and you don't meet our standards. We're saying then that we're not what we ought to be, but I'm better than that person. It helps to make us feel better. But the essence of salvation is this. God became a real human being. God descends. God takes on our humanity. God lives the life we know we should. God dies the death that we deserve, that we owe. God took on a total human nature. Taking on this total human nature, he was frail, he was weak, he was hungry, he was tired. And we learn from Jesus that he did not rely on his own divine power. He trusted in his Father. He relied completely on the indwelling Spirit in complete dependence upon his Father. Jesus is to us the perfect example, the perfect illustration, the perfect person of how to live the life that we can't live because we simply are broken. Jesus, we're more than that, has human feelings. But consider this about the fact, and uh, this really struck me in thinking about having human feelings. Uh, we're told that uh, there's no temptation that's taken us, but what Jesus hasn't experienced first. 
But think about this for a moment. When he was rejected, he felt it more than we do. When he was mocked, Jesus felt it even more. When God turned his back on Jesus, he felt it even more than we would ever feel it. Why? Because he was not, in, he was not inhuman. He was perfectly human. And being perfectly human, that means these things perfectly affected him. Totally. Jesus is the reason why we have this hope. It's this doctrine of Christmas. It's the doctrine of the incarnation. Because only Jesus is fully human and fully God, and he comes and says, let me take your place. Let me live life through you. He came to live the life that we owe, that we should, to take our place, to be our representative, to be our substitute, to be fully and truly and completely human. And here's the thing. If Jesus is not at the same time fully God, he could not have endured all the human punishment and all the judgment that he took upon himself. If Jesus was not fully God, then the value of his death and dying would not be sufficient if he's not God because he would not be infinite. His blood would not be sufficient. God cannot be limited because he's God. And it's his blood that has purchased us. If he was not God, he could not be perfectly human. And thus he couldn't be our perfect salvation. That's why it's so important we understand that the doctrine of Christmas is the doctrine of the incarnation of God becoming human and dwelling amongst us. So the other side of the picture is not just knowing my place, I, that I've taken God's place, but also knowing God's place. What is God's place? Consider this. John 14, 6. Maybe you've memorized it. Maybe you know it. Ah, some, it's a, one of those verses that I believe every Christian should know. And Jesus says this. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the gospel. Jesus is the good news. Essentially, Christianity is not just about Jesus. It's not simply uh, as the way to God. Jesus, I mean, it's not simply concerning Jesus. It's that Jesus is the only way. Think about it like this, I, and, and, and I know that uh, there may be that this, this kind of talk even t causes people to squirm a bit just because, wow, you're, you're being rather strident there, Pastor. And listen, <clears throat> every other religion has a founder, and every other religion, the founder points the way and says, here, this is the way to go. Here, these are the things to do. Every other religion points this way or that way. Every other religion is about us trying to reach up to where God is. But the founders of these religions, they never say, I am the way. Jesus is the one who says, I am the way. I am the truth. So believing Jesus means it's the only way to knowing him. Being a disciple of the person Jesus then is having a relationship with him, having a relationship with a living person. It's knowing a person, it's loving a person, it's serving a person, it's obeying a person, the person of God in Jesus Christ. <laughs> so this season, when we think of Christmas, let's think about the doctrine of Christmas. Let's think about the essence of Christmas. It's that God became human as a tiny baby and he, he lived a life before us that we cannot live, but yet <clears throat> he shows us how to live. As a result of that, because of the doctrine of, Christian, uh, of Christmas, we Christians make some absolute claims. 
Now, I would agree that it's possible for us to be very obnoxious, very rude, very prideful. But we need to understand that it's a matter of humility when we make these claims. It's not a matter of trying to prove anything about God. It's a matter of saying there is clearly a rational basis, clearly reasonable basis for the absolute claims that Christmas and Christ cannot be separated. Yet the whole world wants to enjoy the peace and happiness of Christmas leaving Christ out. Can't be done. Can't be done. What's our response? Our response is this. We need to admit. We need to look in the mirror and say, you know, Dave, you've made yourself out to be God. We need to admit that we have put ourselves firmly in the place where God should be. I'm in charge. I'll rule. I'll, do, I'll make the decisions. Our response needs to be to go beyond that admission, to acknowledge, to embrace that God has put himself in our place, in your place. God himself has come as Jesus, entered into our humanity. What do we need to do? To accept him, to give in, to submit, to yield ourselves to Jesus as Lord. This is where the joy comes in because in accepting him and giving in and in submitting, in comes the joy that we so long for. In comes the peace from the Prince of Peace. In comes someone who listens and who understands. In comes someone who becomes a loving Lord, a loving Master. We also need to ask ourselves the question, do we see then that this guy Jesus is dangerous? that he's a threat, that he's a fake, that he's a fraud. You, you see, there's no in-between. There's no comfortable middle ground here. There's only an acknowledging. Jesus is who he says he is, or there's a rejection, a denial, no middle ground. One cannot have the spirit of Christmas without knowing and yielding to the Christ of Christmas. So this Christmas, there's a special gift that all can have. I want to close by reading a lengthy passage of scripture, which it was just so exhilarating to read it. Yes, it's the greatest gift. Again, written by that great writer and theologian, the Apostle Paul. Romans chapter 8. What then shall we say to these things? Good question. What are we going to do now? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but what gave him up for us all? How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And there's another verse. I just want to make a side note here. Also written by Paul. And he says, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. That's an amazing verse. It's profound. It's outstanding. Then we see, Paul goes on, he says, Who then shall bring any charge against God's elect? The answer is, A. It's God who justifies. If God justifies, we're justified. And who is to condemn? Who then can condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Another question, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who would want to be separated from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress 
or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. None of these things. Down in verse 37, he says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure there's that conviction, there's that certainty, there's that grasping this. I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's amazing. One last question. Can anyone walk away from this gift? Can anyone walk away from this gift? Yes, some do. And so, here's what we need to do. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Those are the words of a very wise man recorded for us to have today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, what a gift. What a gift. What an amazing gift of salvation that you've given to us. And it's not like you stand out there and give it to us. But no, you come to us. You join us where we are. You enter our world. You enter into this space, this space and this time and this reality. And it's your Holy Spirit, which you have imparted to us, to live in us. You even tell us that these bodies are the temple of the Spirit of God. How profound, how amazing. And how could we ever turn from that? Oh God, let this be a special season as we embrace the, the, the truth, the doctrine of Christmas and that God has come to dwell amongst us. We praise your name. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's stay on the same.